Welcome to Time Travelling Team, the weekly podcast where we review every episode of Doctor Who right from the very beginning. I'm Paddy. And I'm Trisha. This week we'll be finishing off our rambling break before we pick up with Patrick Troughton's first story next week by discussing an adventure in space and time, the docudrama slash biopic film created by the BBC for the 50th anniversary of Doctor Who. Before we jump into the discussion on that though, we need to take a quick trip to the other side of the earth to pick up some very special friends of ours. This week we are delighted to be joined by the hosts of the Half Measures podcast, Paul, too sweet to be sour can hour, and Dan, the almighty god, Whiting. So ho- <laughs> hold on tight as we dive right. into the summary. <laughs> and welcome boys. <laughs> Kia ora. thanks for having us. Yeah, Kia ora. I appreciate that. No problem. And thank you for taking time out of your lives to come and join us because it's nine o'clock at night by ye. So, <laughs> and I can tell any of our listeners that in Ireland, this is an ungodly hour for us. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we'll just do the story recap and it's going to be a bit shorter. It's going to be very similar to the ones we've done for the last two movies. So away we go. Now, the story begins with a very sad and dejected looking William Hartnell sitting in his car staring at a police box. The scene then cuts to him angrily interacting with a stagehand just prior to going on set for his final scenes as the Doctor. The scene then shifts to three years earlier where BBC newcomer Sidney Newman is tasked with coming up with a new show to fill a Saturday afternoon time slot. He brings in his former assistant from ITV, Miss Verity Lambert, and pitches the concept of the show detailing the adventures of a mysterious old man in his time machine, which is a police box. She casts veteran character actor William Hartnell in the role, despite his initial reluctance that he may not be right for the part. Despite facing initial roadblocks of sexism, interdepartmental animosity, technical and production issues, and the stigma of producing a sci-fi show, she and her colleagues Warris Hussein and Mervyn Pinfield, together with Hartnell and the rest of the cast, create a national sensation. Hartnell is delighted at the success of the show and forms close friendships with all the cast and crew. However, as the years goes on, the various cast members and production crew move away from the show, leaving Hartnell despondent. This, coupled with his increasingly poor health due to a diagnosis of arteriosclerosis, make him difficult to work with, and the reluctant decision is made to carry on the show without him. Hartnell is devastated at the news but carries on, welcoming his replacement Patrick Troughton and assuring him that he is the only worthwhile successor. As he begins his last scene, Hartnell sees a vision of Matt Smith, the actor who will portray the Doctor during the show's 15th anniversary, giving him an appreciative smile. Hartnell returns the smile, seemingly content that both his own personal legacy and the legacy of Doctor Who will carry on far into the future. The end. Short and sweet and to the point. Absolutely. Thank you, Paddington. Uh, so so no. we should probably... Yeah? Oh no. I was going to say, as always, we're going over to the trivia corner. And this time we'll get... Uh, actually, how about Paul? How about you do the trivia corner section this time? <laughs> you make that <laughs> intro. <laughs> Well, I do have one piece of, uh, of trivia, which you may have in your notes already, Trisha. Are you happy for me to jump in? Because, yeah, you know, no. this is your baby, the, the, the trivia. But I um, so I did a little bit of reading around it, and I discovered that uh, apparently, uh, alongside David Bradley uh, as Hartnell and Reese Shearsmith as Trayton, Matt Gattis was actually going to play John Pertwee, but the scenes were cut out. And if you have a look online, there's actually a photograph of him doing a pretty good impression of the third Doctor, John Pertwee. And I, I just wondered if you were, if that, I'm, I'm sure that's on your trivia uh, already, Trisha. Am I right? It is on mine already. And actually, one of the things that I love is that in the like the making of, it's like the special features on the DVD, or I'm sure you can see it on YouTube or whatever. And um, you do see a couple of clips of him as. Uh, John Pertwee and it's kind of surprising if anyone sort of knows Mark Gattis's work because watching the whole film I was like where's Mark Gattis because usually he would put himself in there somewhere and it turns out he did and he just caught himself <laughs> or he was caught <laughs> it's a shame I would have loved to have seen that um, yeah. before before we dive into the trivia I just want to say something to the guys the first time I watched this right um, there's a sequence in it where Sidney Newman is reading the script for the Daleks and it's intercut with scenes of a rifle being assembled and loaded. Now, I completely forgot that JFK was going to be assassinated on the day that the, the episode first aired. So I was like, who the fuck is trying to kill Sidney Newman? <laughs> <laughs> whoever, whoever made all his lovely sweater vests. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, so into some of the general trivia. So the air date for this, probably surprising for no one, 21st of November 2013. This is obviously for the 50th anniversary of the show. The writer, as we mentioned, was Mark Gattis, well-known actor and writer uh, from the UK. Writing credits include The League of Gentlemen, Sherlock, Dracula and Poirot. Some of his acting credits include, again, Sherlock, 
Game of Thrones, Good Omens, and The League of Gentlemen. For Doctor Who, since the revival in 2005, he has written nine scripts and had five guest appearances. Which is actually quite a lot for for one person. Um, When it comes to this particular film, though, he's actually been wanting to make this for years. He originally pitched it for the 40th anniversary of the show. And apparently, 10 years prior, someone else had actually pitched a similar idea for the 30th anniversary of the show. Um, so he was delighted when he actually finally got to make it, which to you know Paul's trivia point earlier is why I was surprised when I watched it the whole way through. I was like, but why isn't he in it? <laughs> because he wanted to make it so badly. You know, cast himself as Pertwee and then got caught. Uh, the director was Terry McDonough. He's a British television director who's worked on a lot of TV series on both sides of the Atlantic. Peak Practice, Where the Heart Is, The Royal, Vincent... For Dan and Paul, Breaking Bad, Criminal Minds, Suspect Behaviour, and The Expanse. Which I haven't seen. I really should. For our cast, as William Hartnell, we have David Bradley. Now, most people recognise David Bradley from his many, many roles. Maybe from the Harry Potter franchise, where he was Argus Filch. Or from Game of Thrones, as Walter Frey. He was also in Nicholas Nickleby, Blackpool, Hot Fuzz. I love his character in Hot Fuzz. It's just <laughs> yeah. it's brilliant. Broadchurch, The World's End, and Wizards. In the world of Doctor Who, he has also had several roles. So I didn't know this until I was looking this trivia. He was the voice of the Shan Sheath in the Sarah Jane Adventures episode, The Death of the Doctor. Which, for anyone who hasn't seen it, they're these weird vulture-looking aliens that are like intergalactic undertakers. It's probably the best way to describe it. Which, if you think about it, like your vultures kind of are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he also played Solomon in Dinosaurs on a Spaceship during the Series 7. And, of course, he would later come back to play the first Doctor in The Doctor Falls and Twice Upon a Time. After this film was made, himself and the other actors who played Caroline Ford, Jacqueline Hill and William Russell actually continued working with Big Finish. And so they've done a couple of first Doctor stories with the Doctor, Susan, Ian and Barbara for Big Finish. It's those new actors. Again, I haven't listened to them yet, but I've heard really good things about them. So it's on my list of Big Finish listens that need to be done. As Verity Lambert, we have Jessica Rain. She's probably best known for her role in Call the Midwife. But she's also been in The Woman in Black, Wolf Hall, Partners in Crime, The Last Post, Patrick Melrose and The Informer. She also has an on-screen Doctor Who credit. She was in the 11th Doctor story, Hyde, which I don't remember her being in it, but I'm sure in like a million years when Paddy and I eventually get (laughs) series 11, we will discuss her again. As Sidney Newman, we have Brian Cox. What can we say about Brian Cox? He's been in everything. Um, We have (laughs) Churchill's People, King Lear, Manhunter, my second favourite Hannibal Lecter film. Macbeth, X2, X-Men United, my favourite X-Men film. Sharp, one of Paddy's favourites from forever. Mm-hmm. Braveheart, Red Dwarf, the Jason Bourne movies, the remake of The Day of the Triffids, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Churchill, Good Omens, and Paddy, we have one for the board. He was in Zed Cars. Excellent. <laughs> and on the subject of Sharp, he actually appears in two episodes uh, with... Uh, David Troughton, so uh, Patrick Troughton's son. Oh. He play, uh, Pat, uh, David Troughton plays uh, the, the Duke of Wellington, and uh, Brian Cox plays he's like uh, um, basically essentially a spy master, and oh. they have they have a great rapport together. It's just fantastic. Cool. Uh, Brian also has a Doctor Who television credit. He provided the voice of the Ood Elder in the final David Tennant story, The End of Time. When he was younger, Brian actually did meet Sidney Newman. Brian was working for the BBC in the mid-1960s. And he actually briefly met... He wasn't like friends with him or anything, but he briefly met Sidney Newman in the club. And he was able to take that sort of recollection and bring it into his character portrayal, which is really good. As Wars Hussein, we have Sasha Dewan. I knew him first from Iron Fist. Um, He's also been in Last Tango in Halifax, Sherlock again. The Lady in the Van, Not Safe for Work, and Dracula. Doctor Who fans, though, may recognise him from as the latest iteration of The Master, 
he starred opposite Jodie Whittaker in series 12. Now, we do have a lot of Doctor Who cameos. So, I don't know about <laughs> the rest of you. But I did spend all the film going, Ooh, it's that person. Ooh, it's that person. <laughs> Ooh, it's that person. So, we have William Russell, who originally played Ian Chesterton. He's the BBC security guard at the beginning when Sidney Newman arrives. Caroline Ford, who played Susan, is the mum who's calling in her kids for tea. And she's like, yo, that show you wanted to watch is on. That's Caroline Ford, who played Susan. At Verity Lambert's going away party, we have Annika Wills, who originally played Polly. And we have Jean Marsh, who played Joanna in The Crusade. She played Sarah Kingdom and she plays Morgana in a later story we haven't gotten to yet. Matt Smith appears as himself. I don't know if that really counts as a cameo, but... He's just credited as himself. David Baverstock, who's the controller of the BBC, he was played by Mark Eden, who actually played Marco Polo. So he came back. And then Peter Hawkins, who was the Dalek voice person, was portrayed by his successor, Nicholas Briggs, who's done the voice of the Daleks for the last God he knows how many years. He is Mr. Dalek voice. And so he got a chance to play his predecessor, which I think is quite nice. There's a few things in this film that aren't 100% accurate. I'm not going to go through all of them because we'll be here all day nitpicking every single scene of the film and that's not really its purpose. However, there's a few characters that were kind of composited. So Mervyn Pinfield in the film is actually a bit of a composite of a number of different people, including David Whitaker, who was the original story editor. Because if you're just watching the film and you've maybe maybe listened to some of mine and Paddy's podcasts before, you kind of think that Mervyn Pinfield has a sort of greater role in the creation of the show because he was sort of taking Verity under his wing and stuff like that in the film. He's kind of a composite of a number of different people. It was just easier just to cement that down into one person. The comic strip that we see Hartnell and Verity laughing over, that was actually a real comic strip. That was published and it was published on the 25th of November 1964. So a little bit later than when it is shown in the film. One of the other people who wasn't included in the film, though there is a scene from the story that they directed, so I was a bit surprised they weren't there, is actually Paddy Russell, who was the first female director. They show a bit of Hartnell struggling with his monologue, his amazing monologue that I love in the massacre but they have a male director directing him and i don't know why they made the choice not to have it be paddy russell maybe they didn't want to have another sort of subplot of the first female director or whatever in the midst of everything but that should have been paddy russell the film also does indicate that the production of the pilot had to shut down because the fire sprinklers went off and they ran over time and all the lights got turned off. None of that happened. <laughs> the first, the, the pilot episode recording went fine. They did have issues on the Aztecs though, so they kind of pulled that in. Lastly, sometimes this film is confused with adventures in space and time. So it's called An Adventure, singular, in space and time. There is also a documentary from 1999 called Adventures in Space and Time which is about the history of Doctor Who. Adventure in Time and Space is just Paddy fucking up the title of this whenever we've spoken about it. Re- repeatedly today. fucking it up. Um, so uh. that was it for the trivia. Like I said there's a lot of other differences you know some of the chronology is sort of played with and things like that. If you really want to go into all the details, I'm sure you can go on to like the TARDIS fan wiki or Wikipedia and it'll give you a full breakdown. But those are sort of the main ones that jumped out to me. Paddington or Dan or Paul, do you have any other trivia to add? You just gave me a heart attack that I might have watched the right, uh, wrong film. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, have I watched the right one? And I was like, no, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. Um, I have to commend you, uh, Trisha. That is what I would call a full measure of uh, information and detail <laughs> and trivia. It's impressive. Yeah, I don't it, know if I'm quite at John Champion level, but like, you know. <laughs> I think you give him a run for for his money. I um, I didn't know. I really loved hearing the guys, you know, Ian Chesterton uh, and you know, having those guys appear. I didn't know that. Uh, I thought that that's a really nice touch. I love that. Yeah, there, there's only, sadly, as you know, listeners of our podcast will know um there's only so many of them left 
do you know mm. um so it was nice that you know those actors from the original run who are still with us that they were able to be in it which is great but like i think as well like that like just due to like talking the podcast like got people like william russell and carlin ford they've achieved like david attenborough levels of you know we need to keep them safe <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely mm. so on to the meat and bones i suppose shall we boys sure yeah cool so we go on to our character discussion so we have four main characters for this we obviously have william hartnell himself uh, and then we've got Verity, Sydney, and Waris. Now, again, I'm just going to point out something for our listeners because when do I not take the opportunity to take the piss out of Patty? Um, again, I usually take our character list by... I take a quick glance into Patty's notes, steal the character titles, and then shut it down. And Patty had his... Because obviously you copied and pasted this from a different template. He had the doctor... David Bradley. <laughs> like, yeah. He's not playing the doctor. He's playing William Arnold. <laughs> well, I'm a busy man. I can't afford to just change two words, okay? Leave me alone. <laughs> I'm like an old telegram service. It costs more. <laughs> cool. So why don't we turn it over to Dan and Paul first? So, Dan, Paul, what were your thoughts on David Bradley as William Hartnell? I, I thought he was a great choice. I... I thought he was really, you know, I thought he was perfectly suited in terms of how he looked. Because I, I know in real life he was much older than what Hartnell was at the time. But um, I, I thought in terms of his voice as well, his mannerisms, I thought he had those, uh, you know, really down to a T. Um, I think I was quite surprised how grumpy the portrayal of William Hartnell was. I knew he had a bit of impatience about him. And I've come to learn some of the reasons about that through your podcast. But in my mind, if anything, Patrick Troughton was a grumpier type. And I always thought William Hartnell was a bit more gentle. But I thought, yeah, I thought David Bradley was um, was a really good casting. And I guess the, the biggest compliment I could give him in that respect is that I cannot think of anyone else who who could have done a better job than him as Hartnell. So, yeah, I was I was really impressed. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Paul. I think um, David Bradley plays a... He, he's so great at playing sort of a cantankerous, grumpy old bugger. And I think he, he, does, he does this role really well. And I think he does it with um, quite a bit of heart as well. And I think um, for someone like... I'd, I'd be the least experienced... Uh, person around Doctor Who on this podcast and I, I think he did a, a really nice job at kind of showing you his uh, his sort of grumpy edge but almost really sort of making you feel for him and, and feel a lot of compassion for the character as it sort of takes you on a bit of a, a whirlwind tour through his, his tenure as the Doctor. Mm, and he, he did have some gentler moments didn't he? I, I think my favourite moment actually was when he when that group of school children on that field trip bump into him and he just sort of throws himself into the moment and becomes the doctor in front of the kids. And it was, I think if you could have imagined how cool it would have been to have been, I don't know how much embellishment there was there in terms of did that really happen? But I thought if you could imagine being a kid at that age and seeing the doctor do that, I mean, I used to get excited going to the supermarket in the eighties when Spider-Man was going to show up. And let me tell you, he did not look convincing as Spider-Man. So I thought <laughs> this was, this was next level. <laughs> I, I think too, because especially with that sort of scene early on where he's a bit grumpy with his granddaughter, um, and then you know he actually kind of uses her as a bit of inspiration to keep the show pure and you know do things like this is the button that opens the doors and like not letting um, you know the other new directors and stuff sort of uh, push him in different directions. So I thought it was really cool. It was it was a great casting choice. Much like Paul said, I I couldn't imagine or think of anyone else who could maybe play that role quite so well, apart from uh, maybe William Hartnell himself. Yeah, I, I would agree. I'd agree. Paddy, what did you think of him? Um, so, like, I've liked David Bradley for a very long time, um, like, in, in, in his role in Harry Potter, um, even in movies like Harry Brown, where he plays Michael Caine's friend. Uh, then there's, like, you know, obviously, you know, he was great in Game of Thrones. Um, but when I watched him with this, I was like, Visually, I think he's like a complete mimic of William Hartnell. So, like, an absolute yeah. Again, I couldn't, I can't think of anyone that could fill the role as well as he did. But I love like he did. He just essentially gives a kind of like a warts and all performance of like William Hartnell, um, in the sense of like you know maybe not very tolerant of people that weren't like him, as as we talked about you know throughout the thing, yeah. um. His like cantankerous moments, like his kind of old school mentality to stuff, but then again on the flip side we see 
like you know giving Caroline Ford like a load of flowers to to apologize for being a, a grumpy bollocks um his like great fondness of Warris Hussein like to the extent like there's actually a really I, I kind of ch- I chuckled at it and it was like Warris uh, was moving away from the show and he'd been offered a show called The Passage to India and uh William Hartle goes oh is it a one way trip and it was just like that sort of a and like Warris just laughs at him because he knows exactly what Bill is like and I was like like that's a, that's a really good friendship and but again as I said like you know what Dan was saying about you know him getting mad at his granddaughter earlier on and it's just I think that I would say and I know this isn't favoritism but this is probably the best performance that David Bradley has given in anything well and yeah no I, and again like that's could be against like you know the great like you know the stuff that he did is like Walter Frey like he's great again he's got great comedic stuff as Mr. Filch and even like as I said the one well, of the first things I think I ever saw him in was a movie Harry Brown um, and again he just the character he plays in that is like it's just a you feel so sorry for him um, mm, yeah but like it, so again he's just a phenomenal actor in terms of the various characters that he plays and I, I would definitely say that this is like his peak performance <laughs> yeah <laughs> stealing something from the half measures guys there Paddy absolutely absolutely <laughs> <laughs> the thing, you actually mentioned the scene where he gives uh, Caroline Ford you know, a load of flowers apparently that's a sort of slight retelling of a story that happened on the set so he did blow his top on Marco Polo a little bit but what he actually did is that he delivered flowers to each of the women in the cast so to Jacqueline Hill and to Caroline and to the lady whose name I've forgotten who played um Paddy fill in the sentences I'm trying to make played Chingpo no mm. No, that's not her name. Uh, I, I, you know, no, it is. I can't remember the act- actress's name, but um, yeah, Ching Po. Yeah, um, he gave them. No, sorry, flowers. Ping Cho. Ping, ping, ping Cho. Ping, ping Cho. Cho. There we go. Jesus. Um, yeah. he gave the actresses flowers, and then he didn't know what to give the gentleman, so he got them a tin of biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> works for me. Absolutely. Adorable. Fuck it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll be honest. I was a little bit unsure going into this how I was going to respond to. David Bradley doing Bill Hartnell. Um, I've spoken on the podcast before that I've seen clips of him in Twice Upon a Time. And the characterization of the first Doctor that really soured me to him. But to be honest, I shouldn't have been worried. He was absolutely amazing. Like everything you guys have said, I genuinely can't think of another actor who could have done Bill more justice than David Bradley did. I've seen a couple of interviews with William Hartnell himself and while I think David's voice is a little bit more gruff sounding than Bill is on a sort of day to day it doesn't take from the performance in the least and like since we started doing the podcast you may be able to I've become very protective of William Hartnell (laughs) and his legacy on the show and for the first part of the film I was practically screaming at my telly because Obviously, they're trying to get a show made and they're trying to, like, appease everybody. So they do kind of take advantage of him a little bit. You know, they're making false promises and I'm there kind of going, stop lying to him. Like, don't, you know, (laughs) stop being mean. But it was lovely to see that over time he developed real friendships with these people. And David showed that really, really well. And again, like you know, Dan mentioned the whole thing with like, you can't press that button because that button opens the door and I'm on the other side and that doesn't work and all that kind of stuff. I think he brought it in really, really well. And he really highlighted that, you know, for William Hartnell, this was for the kids and he had to do right by them. And I think, you know, he makes a valid point in the film, which, you know, I think a lot of writers and directors who do children's programming maybe forget which is that the kids will know Mm. you know the kids know Mm. if you're pressing random buttons today to make the screen come on and you press the same button next week and it makes the door open kids will pick up on that and i i need to look into it maybe a bit more but the whole idea of like you know paddy and i mentioned in our podcast that like the pilot version of the first doctor is uh, a little yes l- less Yoda like 
than the first Doctor eventually became. And more of just a grumpy bollocks who's a bit evil, maybe. Um, and I like the fact that, you know, in the film they showed that, you know, it was William being like, hey, where's this, like, twinkle in the eye that you said he's going to have? And that you have Verity going, no, you were right. You do the character that you think he should be. Um, I think I think it was it was absolutely brilliant. Mm. Uh, so on to Verity Lambert. So Paddy, why don't you go first on Verity? Cool. So um, I don't think um, like I obviously I'd seen Hyde, the episode that she uh, Jessica Rain appeared in, but I couldn't really remember her leading into this. And since I've watched this, I've seen some episodes of her and called a midwife. And I think Jessica Rain is a great actress. And I think the one thing that's going to be kind of a run through of the all the characters is that after this, watching this, I went away and I watched some interviews um, with these people, and she like represented Verity really, really well, because like, Ver- Verity like obviously the later interviews it was kind of after the fact, so she was very kind of self assured and kind of saying, well, I simply went in and I did this, and as a result, here we are now type thing, whereas in the show, like you get the impression that. This is someone that was just handed a job, but then it became her child. Like it be, she became super protective of it, and like there's a great sequence where uh, Sydney Newman is thinking about just cancelling the show, and because of the whole Daleks, and he has this aversion to robots or bug-eyed monsters, and she just lays into him like, and she's on about they're not bug-eyed monsters. She details exactly what the Daleks are, the message behind the story, everything, and I was like. You, you, Verity Lambert, don't realise how attached you've gotten to this show until you hear yourself back after you've just spoken to your boss. So I, I, I think that she, uh, herself and David Bradley are, are like the two beating hearts, you know, the, the, the kind of frayed beating hearts of this uh, docudrama. And she's great in it. I think, I think she did a really, really good performance here. I'd agree. Dan, Paul? I thought one of the, like... One of the interesting things about, um, I guess, uh, her role is, I and I didn't really go through a, lo- a lot of this, um, they sort of touched on it kind of lightly, but I would have imagined it would have been a really big deal uh, for her to produce uh, Doctor Who back in the in the 60s and um, as, as a woman. And I think... I, like I thought the the way that it was all portrayed was um was great and it was awesome, but I imagine there would have been lots of additional sort of backroom struggles and challenges that would have had to be sort of worked through to to, to land this in the way that it did. Um, I thought the the portrayal of the character was great. Uh, one of um, Jessica's roles, which stood out for me actually, is a is a favourite show of Paul and mine. She actually um, plays a character in Line of Duty, um, which is a top show. Highly recommended. Yeah, my wife watches that, so I think um, I asked her there one day would she be willing to rewatch, and she was like, "Yes." So <laughs> I think that's going to be on our uh, couple's rewatch soon. Nice, nice. Yeah, look, I um, I was just looking through the back catalogue as well as you were, obviously there, Dan, and you know, I spotted like Robin Hood is in there, and and Baptiste is a show I've watched, but I can't remember seeing her. She's and yet in this. I thought she was actually the standout. I, I thought the performance that she gives was was so natural. It was so genuine, and you know, just like this whole project, this whole thing is as a great vehicle for William Hartnell's story to be told. I really liked that she sort of her story had the opportunity to be told as well, because you know, as Dan said, she faced that real uphill battle, you know, a real struggle in nineteen sixties Britain, and you know, she gives as good as she gets with some very, you know, sort of old grey white men at the Beeb and she you know she's taking no crap from any of them and I I thought that was really really good and she kind of she kind of looks like she's from that era as well she kind of has a a face and look for that time as well so great casting at the the Beeb is that the most British thing I've ever heard (laughs) it is at the Beeb (laughs) don't let the accent fool you indeed (laughs) yeah I, I would agree with everything you guys have said I think you know again I've seen interviews that Verity has done and she's very much, oh, this is what I did. And she's very, you know, just states the fact and she doesn't really make a big deal of it. But like she was the first female drama producer at the BBC. You know, when you see her walking in, you know, that first scene where she's walking into the BBC. I mean, there was an interesting thing in 
on one of the websites where I got the trivia notes from, which was that, oh, you see some of the women wearing trousers. Women didn't wear trousers at the BBC. You mean the in the nineteen sixties? Apparently, at the Beeb in the nineteen sixties. Do you know? So, like, I like the fact that they showed some components of that. I think um, t- jumping a little bit to my overall, I would have loved to have seen this as a mini series mm. where we maybe got to explore that in a little bit more detail. Because obviously, this was like William Hartnell was the star. Mm. Um, but I would have liked to have seen that struggle in maybe a little bit more detail. But yeah, I like that they don't cool. shy away from it either. Yeah. Do you know? Mm. Like they have um, a scene you know, with Waris Hussein where she basically says like, oh, so they just think that she's Sidney Newman's piece on the side. So he gave her the job, do you know? I think one of the important things with this, though, is... You know, a lot of people in this day and age sort of say, oh, the classic show was sexist or the classic show was racist or the classic show was like, the classic show was Verity. She made the show. If it wasn't for her, we would have no Doctor Who. I think this is an absolutely great representation of that. And I think the relationship that they show developing between her and Bill Hartnell was beautiful to see. It was absolutely lovely and you're thinking back to the arc when we were talking about how Verity had left at that point and we you know Paddy and I discussed that as a trivia note oh Bill was very sad when Verity left and then to watch him and how devastated he is that she's leaving it was super emotional mm. <laughs> I'll just put it that way yeah and like he even says like you know like uh, to her like just before I think maybe before she makes that announcement he goes like you're my rock Verity and I'm like oh god <laughs> yeah oh it's amazing <sighs> so I'm your wingman with- goose <laughs> 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 with William Hartnell and Verity kind of being sort of the main characters of this film as it were we have sort of the two supporting characters in their lives which are Sidney Newman and Wars Hussein so uh let's see picking one of the three boys here we'll go with paul <laughs> paul what did you think of brian cox's sydney newman brian cox has um he's long long been a favorite of mine and when you were mentioning in the trivia the sorts of things he's been in i was also thinking of um deadwood which i thought he was great in and yeah. i've forgotten the name of the movie now but he was in a movie with uh uh what's his name ray fiends's brother was it joseph about a prison escape movie he was great in that and so i was just so pleased to see him in this and look i have no idea what sydney newman might have been like in real life but i feel like he brought that character to life in terms of i feel like i have a really good sense of what that character was like now um that sort of that uh that overconfidence that bravado that short tempered but with a you know with that determination and that, that, that real vision there are and i felt like you know and again i guess maybe we don't know how much of this is embellishment, but there were so many sliding doors moments that hinged on his decisions that, you know, let's be honest, depending on which way he might have gone, depending on how Verity may have pushed him, we may not be here today talking about Doctor Who. Um, but uh, no, I mean, he was terrific. He really played that. It came you know, it came across as that sort of big boss, stereotypical North American type, but uh, I thought it was really, really satisfying and, um, you know the, the the way he 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 obviously respected Verity uh, and trusted her, but at the same time he was really quick to come down on her, and I thought the way he balanced that was was quite good. Yeah, I don't know a, a lot about Sydney Newman at the Beep, but um, one of the things I thought was was cool is just basically how he he basically just dropped a seed of the idea, and it was like this is my concept for a show go away and work it out and what what a awesome sort of like gift to go and like you know get to go and run with sort of a, a sort of a seed of an idea and go and explore it or vice versa even just to be the person just dropping your ideas and being like go and sort it out come back to me when you've got something um it's pretty exciting I think you're right Paul it's definitely one of those sliding door moments because it very it definitely could have gone uh, different ways but Brian Cox is awesome. Like he's he's always a real standout in everything that he's in. Um, and I thought again he did a great job in this. 
Yeah, like um, I just in my notes isn't it, like you put Brian Cox in anything, and I will watch it, mm. um, or listen to it, or in some events play it because he's the villain in the PS2 game Manhunt, and it, and it's like um, I was like going, oh god, I really like Brian Cox, but I hate you in this game. You're such an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just actually the thing is that uh, the first thing I ever think I saw Brian Cox in was actually X2. And as as uh, William Stryker and like I, I I love the character of Stryker Stryker in the X Men comics. He's just so wonderfully evil, and like you you understand his rash like you can see where he's coming from. But at the same time, it's like wrong. It was like going no, sorry, I'm not buying into your bullshit whatsoever. But uh, when I actually found out he was Scottish, I was like, whoa, this is actually very surprising. He's in a, yeah, he's Scottish. Wow. Yeah. Um, and like he was like going that that one shows his uh, capabilities and versatility as an a- as an actor, and I again after this I watched an interview with Sidney Newman and he he's gone down perfectly like Sidney is very kind of brash and very confident in everything that he says and does, you know because he's very experienced like you know at the start of this he's come from ITV, so he's like the outsider looking to put his stamp on stuff, um and we were talking there about sliding door moments there's a fantastic moment where. He's watched the pilot. He's giving his feedback to Warris, and like they're too afraid to do anything. And he's there eating a Chinese dinner. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And he's like, "You gotta change this. You gotta choose this." Jesus Christ, they're going to kill me. But just redo the whole thing. And I was like, for an, for a guy that's come from a rival company to come in and make a statement like that, that's ballsy. That's really really ballsy. But. Uh, yeah, again, I think that this will go up there with like one of the great performances that Brian Cox has given a lot in anything, you know. Mm. Yeah, I think you know. Again, like I, I would echo everything you guys have said. You know, Brian Cox. If he's in something, you watch it. Like, um, yeah. my first, I think my first Brian Cox one was actually Manhunter, where he played the original Hannibal Lecter on film, which I loved as a film. If anyone, if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend. But going into this, again, I hadn't really seen much of Sydney himself and things. But I know, like, from going through the trivia and stuff like that, like, if you imagine, here's this Canadian producer coming into the very stuffy BBC. Like, the Beeb at the time was very much period dramas and the Queen's English mm. and, you know, very, very much by the book. And you've got this big, brash character. I think Brian does an amazing job showing just how different Sydney was to the rest of the BBC at the time. You know, in the way he carried himself. And the clothes that he wore were his really vibrant, um, like, sweater vests. Mm. In, you know, the fact that he you know, took a chance on Verity and Warris. And, you know, like to Paddy's point, he's like, just, just do it again. What I did really like, though, is that he's not completely one-dimensional. He's not just the big, brash, bold, knows what he wants and goes for a character. You know, he took a gamble on Doctor Who and, you know, when he freaks out over the Dalek story, being like, I didn't want bug-eyed monsters. And he's basically telling Verity, like, I made a mistake with you. I promoted you too quickly. You know, he was still a man of the 60s, <laughs> Do you know? He still saw a mistake. And as opposed to letting her run with it, was like, no, I made a mistake. I'm going to pull this back. Um, so it was nice to see that other dimension to him because he could have been a very one-dimensional character otherwise, I think. Mm. And they did a very good job showing the edges of that. And I think the fact that Brian had met him even in passing in his mm. youth, you can clearly see the bits of him that he picked up from that interaction and brought into the character. So I thought I thought Sydney was was brilliant. Um yeah. absolutely fantastic character. And there's actually another really good scene in it, um, where uh, William Hartnell is throwing a strop and Sydney just happens to be on the set and they're like, Oh Sydney, come and please meet William Hartnell and he just like like that, just starts placating him with like, Oh, you were in these amazing movies and I was saying to Trish earlier on, I actually went away and I watched all these movies and William Hartnell is actually great in these performances. <laughs> But like, he was like placating him and plumossing him, and it's great. And then, like, he walks away at Verity, and it's like, Yeah, yeah, sort your shit out, otherwise, I'll sort it out for you. And it was like, that That's that's such an amazing boss thing to do is like, you know, oh, placate the client, and then like turn around to go, like, stop fucking up. <laughs> yeah, um, so, yeah. 
And that just leaves Sasha Dewan as Boris. Indeed, indeed. How about you lead us into this one, Trish? Cool. So Sasha Dewan had a big job ahead of him. And I, I say that, I mean, obviously they all did, but like, Boris Hussein is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> And he was on set when they were filming this. <laughs> so <laughs> Sasha Dewan has said that like he met with Warris several times to understand him and stuff. And Warris was saying that it was kind of weird because, you know, you can imagine you've got this you know, young actor who's going to portray you. He's like, oh, was he watching the way I was tilting my head or lifting my tea or whatever? But can you imagine like being at a script read through or being like filmed and the guy that you're going to be is just over there? And it's like, he had a big job with that, you know, irrespective of everything else. But I think he completely knocked it out of the park. You know, Morris has said in interviews that, you know, the one piece of advice he gave to Sasha Dewan was play it as the most important thing is directing a good show. That was the only thing that mattered to Morris Hussein was direct a good show. And... That is entirely what came across. They didn't make a big thing of his ethnicity. It came up once or twice. It was a thing, but they didn't focus on it. And I think that actually does Warris a really... It really shows Warris well because Warris wasn't at the BBC to fight racism or to do any of this stuff. He was there to make TV shows. And I think Sasha really, really played that well. Again, the relationship between him and Verity... It's just like the scenes with the two of them in the club after hours. It's the two of them sort of looking at everyone else <laughs> and they're going, yeah, let's you and I stick together because <laughs> we're not them. <laughs> we don't fit in with them. So you and I can be buddies. So yeah, I think, I think he did a great, a great job. No, no, you go on. I, you go on as on. you say, I, I agree with you. I, I love that chemistry that uh, he had with, um, with, with Verity and that camaraderie they had and as, as those two new kids on the block I thought that was, was really nice I thought um, I've only seen Sasha in a couple of things he was in the second season of Line of Duty so another Line of Duty uh, performer and uh, also in Marvel's Iron Fist um, so th- this was sort of like um, the first time I sort of had anything to compare it to and uh, look I thought he was I thought he was fine I, I have to admit Thinking back on it, a bit of a half measures approach to this. Um, he didn't feel as prominent to me in this particular film, but um, I'm sure he was. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I thought he was was really really good. I thought um, that that camaraderie was the real thing that sold it well for me with, with him and Verity together. It seemed like a real good a real good team. And then the idea of you know when Verity's leaving and all the rest of it must have been you know quite hard for them all, but based on what I've seen and you know at the end of the credits when they sort of say what happened to them afterwards you know it seems like they did pretty well for themselves yeah I, I don't really have a, a lot to add I think much like you Paul I, I know um, Sasha mostly from Iron Fist um, Line of Duty and Dracula um, but I thought he did a he did a great job um, with his portrayal um, I, I really liked just I think he did a good job um, and I think even some of the effects that they use within the um, the Doctor Who universe and and the way they, they they kind of like point to his character, but I don't I don't think like he was never meant to be sort of a, a main character of the story, was he? Like you know, much like we talked about the other ones. Like I think he, if this was a mini series, you could see him kind of having potentially his his own episode or a bit more of a deep dive into him. But I think um I think this is a, a great portrayal, uh, interesting character. I'd I'd almost be interested to find out more. Yeah, like um, I completely agree with everything you're saying because again, watched interviews with Warris, but uh, like even there's interviews with like the with the surviving ca- cast and crew, and they all give their memories of um, Hartnell. Like Warris is there talking about him, and it's like Sasha the one like as if he felt that he Warris was watching him, he was clearly watching Warris as well because again, the mannerisms are done perfectly, and you do get like that sense of passion that he wants to prove himself. Initially, he wants to prove himself, and then he goes. It's a case like he wants to prove the show as well, and uh, there's a reference to in when Verity's on the bus to work one day, and she sees a group of kids pretending to be Daleks, and you know, like they find out that they had ten million viewers for that episode, and like herself and Warris just do like this like huge like hug, and they just shout off the rooftops of the Beeb, and uh, <laughs> you're tree for tree now, Paul. We're all saying it. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah it was just like again 
this was the first thing I ever saw him in. So I was like, you know what? You know, he's interesting, that kind of stuff. And then I saw him in Sherlock, and then he was in Iron Fist. And it's just, you realize that, w- I know he's in uh, Doctor Who as uh, the master. And it's just like, Waris Hussein is one of those just like, uh, I, re- I had a discussion with a member of the Facebook uh, fan group the other day. Uh, we're talking about Noel Clark, who plays Mickey Smith in the revival of Doctor Who. Uh, it's like himself and Sasha are like just two of those really solid young British actors that you put them into anything and you're going to get a great performance. And I think definitely like you know, Sasha does a fantastic job here. And yeah, like definitely if it had been a miniseries, I would have loved to seen a whole episode dedicated to him. Definitely, definitely. So coming around to our overall thoughts on this film now for the last two ramblings Paddy and I haven't given ratings out of five but in honour of Dan and Paul uh, if people want to include a guns akimbo uh, scoring for this film they are more than welcome to do so so why don't we start with Dan Dan what were your overall thoughts on this film uh yeah I think this this was an interesting one for me going in I to be honest I kind of went in a bit blind, not really knowing what to expect. Um, and I guess historically, when you're watching a, a movie about sort of the creation of, or the sort of the, the history of, of something, it can be a little bit uh, a little bit dry or, or not so fun. But I, I actually really love this. And I think, um, as you know, I sort of said before, I'm, I'm not the biggest... Uh, uh, Doctor Who fan, I've sort of got like an, enough surface knowledge, but I actually found this sort of almost sort of awoken a bit of a, a hunger inside me, I actually thought, and made me want to actually watch some Doctor Who. So I think this is actually a, a really great um, movie, you know, to kind of, you know, spark a bit of interest in Doctor Who. It's um, it's an interesting story that's been told. It's, it's kind of lighthearted. It's quite an easy watch. Like, at no point did I sort of find myself... Um, sort of being distracted or bored so where would I rate it on the guns akimbo scale now this is a complicated scale like sometimes there's there's thousands of guns sometimes there's four I'd I'd probably give it three out of four guns on the guns akimbo scale nice for me I I was surprised how much I enjoyed it as well and I think the surprise factor for me was because I've never really watched any William Hartnell episodes at length and this may sound a little offensive, but my memories of the first Doctor are actually more of Richard Herndall, who played him in The Five Doctors. Um, so, uh, so yeah, th- and you know, this was an emotionally driven story, and I thought it was just, it was all the better for it. And, you know, I, I would love to know what William Hartnell might make of this movie being made, of how his, you know, of how his Doctor paved the way f- for where we are now with, with, with Jodie Whittaker and the TARDIS. And, you know, I, f- I found it, was really well made so i'm really glad that you invited us to to watch it for this podcast because it was a really rewarding watch and i loved seeing how some of the things for the for the show were developed and the guy who was putting together the the daleks and the tardis control room and the console almost seemingly with with random things he had to hand that went on to become the basis of what is still in use today again who knows how much of that was embellished for the sake of creative license but uh I, and also, I just really enjoyed the the idea of this movie in terms of um, I started thinking I would love some of my my favorite shows like you know, Star Trek, the original series, like seeing a, a version of that with Gene Roddenberry never heard of being it. made. Ne- never heard of it, Dan? <laughs> we'll talk about that off air. Um, so, yeah, I, look, I just thought it was a, a, a really great performance from everyone seeing all the effort that went into it i feel really sad about how much of those hartnell years has been lost and destroyed and i guess you know that makes it even more you know what your podcast is doing each week even more important because you know I'm, I'm literally learning about um you know this this old who because of your pod and so yeah I, I, look i think for once i agree with dan i'd give that three out of four guns on the on the guns akimbo scale so um yeah great stuff um, on the subject of the like doing a Star Trek version, I just I have this um notion in my head that William Shatner would demand that they use the digital de aging process so he could play himself in it, <laughs> and that's the way it should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No one can get, do me better than me, hundred <laughs> percent. Um, so uh, with this, I remember the first time I watched it, I, I enjoyed it because like I watched it as um just after it aired, 
and now after going back and redoing all partner and watching it after this it's my appreciation of my love of it has actually grown because now i know a lot more about all the stuff that went on in the background and um it, it just makes me fall in love with the Hartnell era more and more and like I don't think anything will ever like top Tom Baker for me as the doctor but William Hartnell is definitely though he is my second favorite doctor um because just everything of uh and this helps kind of prove that in the sense of the man was as we talked about he's flawed he was you know, he was uh, cranky he's you know temperamental the whole lot but he had such a passion for the show that yeah, it it does like awakens the hunger in you that you're like, Jesus, I want to go back and I want to watch this. I want to like you know do the whole thing all over again, um, and like that comes down as well like to the performances by everyone here. Like we just you know David Bradley, Jessica Rain, Brian Cox, uh, Sasha Dewan, and everyone else, even the guy that plays Mervyn Pinfield, um, who I only ever know from playing Cedric Diggory's dad in The Goblet of Fire. <laughs> um, uh, he like they all do like such a fantastic job of like representing what this show means to everyone and like mark gattis has like you know he is an uber fan like he is essentially he's a guy that's been given like the keys to the toy chest and he's being doing everything that he wants he has such a love and reverence for everything about doctor who that it's put it in put into this um i loved all the little easter eggs uh the cameos like i, I liked watching the post uh, credits interviews um so I think I would give this... I'm going to refer to this as the Neo or, or the all the guns on the Guns of Kimbo scale. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, Trish? So, Paddy has a little bit of a preview of what I'm going to say in this, right? Because I messaged him as soon as I finished watching it. Having gone through, at this point, 29 stories worth of trivia... I thought I was ready to watch this. I thought, okay, it's going to be all the little things that me and Paddy have kind of discussed in the trivia section and we're going to see it played out. I wasn't ready. I was nowhere near ready. And when COVID is over and me and Paddy Fox can actually meet each other in person, <laughs> you were getting a royal front up the hole for not warning me. I spent the entire second half bawling my eyes out. I was not emotionally prepared for this at all. Yeah, so uh, when myself and Trish lived together for a while, um, I introduced her to the original Planet of the Apes series. And we got to the third one, Escape. And I was like, oh, you know, it's a bit emotional. She was like, tell me. Tell me now or I'll hit you. So <laughs> I was like, so ever since then, whenever we go in to talk about something, I have to use the Planet of the Apes scale. And I completely forgot to apply it to this. So, yeah. <laughs> no. Like, I, I I think I think what you said there, Pat, um, sorry Trisha, is is so 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 important because it was a very emotional journey, and I I found that Matt Smith cameo as well was just at that peak of the emotion as well when everything was going on and uh, everything hit. It was perfect. I didn't understand the Matt Smith cameo, but uh, I didn't quite understand. I, I don't think I need to understand it. I just thought it was nice, but there was a lot of emotion, and then when he shows up. Um, yeah, I think for a Hoovian, this is an emotional watch. And shame on you, Paddy, for not giving fair warning. <laughs> like the minute it started with Caroline Ford's departure, and literally the minute I'd stop crying, something else would happen, and I would just start crying all over again. And I was just like, "Oh my god!" Like you know, one of the sort of big Doctor Who sort of emotional things comes at the end of David Tennant's run, where he says i don't want to go and everyone sort of turns to that and it's the really emotional moment they mirrored that in this with william hartnell breaking down at home and just repeating that just repeating i don't want to go and as much as i love david tennant his scene in doctor who has nothing on this image of an older gentleman in his smallish country home, stood at his fireplace, bawling his eyes out because he is too old and too ill to continue to do the show that he loves. And I was gone. I went through like an entire box of tissues. It was really emotional. I had no ice cream in the house or anything. So Paddy and I will be having words. 
when we see each other in person. Yeah. Um, on the whole, though, I think, I think the emotional hit with the Matt Smith thing, I would agree with you, Paul. It really sort of brought it, that emotion up to the height. That would actually be the one criticism I would have is I don't think Matt Smith should have been in it. I know what they were trying to do with it, which is like it's... William Hartnell imagining what the show could be like in the future and sort of showing like little could he know that 50 years later they'd be on this doctor but for me I think it ages the production like whether you're on the 11th 13th or the 26th doctor it started with Sidney Verity Warris and William Hartnell so I think adding Matt Smith to the film it's sort of it puts a rubber stamp on the film of we made this film for the 50th rubber stamp. And I think that rubber stamp shouldn't be there because the film itself should mm. be timeless. Maybe they could have gone with a, a Rise of Skywalker and kind of had all of the doctors kind of call out <laughs> like, the, <Yeah. laughs> like, like the horse, but no no visuals. Yeah, yeah, but I, I completely agree. I think this is an amazing film. I, I wasn't sure what to expect going in. I was kind of expecting it to be a little bit campy because it's Doctor Who. Doctor Who's can't be, but like I wasn't, I was nowhere near expecting to be an emotional wreck by the end of it. Paddy messaged me asking me if I'd watch the special features. I was like, my heart actually can't take it. I'll watch them tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, I was destroyed. So, on in terms of a guns akimbo scale, I, I have to give it the full guns because, like, having gone through, like I said, the last twenty nine stories for the pod, and then seeing this, and my absolute love of William Hartnell, like. It was amazing. I absolutely loved it. So I think that's a very ringing endorsement from yourselves and from Half Measures, who are only kind of really getting into the Hartnell stuff through us, and from ourselves as well, who have just the whole way along. So I think now what we'll do is we're going to go to the secondary aspect of this particular episode and we're actually going to get to know the guys a small bit better uh, for, and you can get to know them a bit better as well. So we have a list of questions followed by a quiz. Uh, <laughs> so Trish, how about you lead us off onto the first question? Yeah, so before we jump into the first question, I suppose we should probably give our listeners a bit more of an introduction to you guys. So Dan Paul, why don't you explain to our listeners what exactly is Half Measures? So Half Measures is a, a weekly podcast and I guess our the catchphrase that we like to put to put with it is that it's the What to Watch podcast where we talk about, you know, what to watch on your streaming services, what movies you might want to see. Uh we talk about, you know, peak performances from some of our favourite actors and actresses. It's it's basically me and Paul talking about to be honest, a conversation we're all gonna be having anyway about, you know, things that we've been watching and things that we've been enjoying. Excellent. Great. So first things first is what was your inspiration for starting the podcast? I'll just start by saying I had never for a second thought about ever doing a podcast. And so it was it was Dan's suggestion. Um, and my first reaction when he said it was, well, firstly, who the hell would want to listen to anything I have to say? And then secondly, if I did do a podcast, what the hell would I actually say when, you know, when the record button gets pressed? Um <laughs> But um, yeah, so as someone who's not too social, you know, I spend most of the time with my family. It felt like a good way for me to maybe to be a little bit more social in a non-face-to-face way, have some fun uh, more than anything else and just see if we could make it a, a bit of a success. What about you, Dan? So before Half Measures, uh, Paul and I used to run a little website called uh, Night Gathers, and it was basically the the written format of, you know, kind of Half Measures, I guess. At, at the website doesn't exist anymore, but that sort of started where we would review movies and try and sort of, you know, write an article about the latest episode of, a, of Walking Dead or whatever it may be. And we always kind of knew because it got quite long, some of these articles, that no one really wanted to read it. Like That sort of content was really much better for, for YouTube or, or a podcast, but we did it anyway because it was quite a bit of fun. Um, and we, we did it for a couple of years until eventually we kind of just kind of just stopped doing it. And then uh, always I kind of had a, a desire to go back and you know restart Night Gathers or do something like that. And that's sort of when the idea of a podcast come about and so when I talked to Paul about it I, I actually thought he was going to be like nah there's no way I'm too busy I'm too busy and uh, too busy with my family I'm too busy with everything else but um, you know when we started the podcast you know 
I think we did um, there was we did one episode in December, then we did another one at like the end of January. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever read anything on how to start a podcast, that's not the way to start a podcast. Like, you know, you're meant to have like a, a regular pattern to the way you do it. You're meant to have a good sort of format. So we really kind of came in um, a little bit half cooked. But I think at the at the, end, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's always just been, you know, the 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 cool thing we love about it is we just love talking about this stuff. So whether there's one person listening or there's a thousand people listening, it, it doesn't really matter. We're just having a, a great time talking about the stuff that we love. And like that's definitely clear because like I like with myself and Trish, we listen to you like every week, and it's like you just have so much fun on it. Uh, whether it's like just having a good old chuckle at what you've seen or listening to the beautiful dulcet tones of Mr. Paul Canauer. <laughs> 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 yeah uh that that was i sorry but that was actually great i i it came out of nowhere when you sang and i was just laughing and it was just wonderful i we the, we the people <laughs> demand more um so um why the half measure style of the reviewing um, i'm happy for you to talk about the the style dan but what i can quickly throw in here is the the name mm -hmm. Um, which sort of led to the style. And so it was 2019, as Dan said, and we were sort of going back and forth on a WhatsApp conversation for ideas for the podcast name. And Dan, you may recall around that time you were mid Breaking Bad rewatch and it was really resonating with you. Um, and it, in fact, I even found a tweet from you on the 10th of September 2019 where you actually give the full Jonathan Banks uh, quote uh, for Have Measures. And so I think, you know, because we were doing that at exactly the same time we we're trying to decide on the name that's how the name came to mind and we sort of very quickly won the approval of of the list that we'd started drawing up but um for me uh, the style is that there's very little prep and that's what makes it fun and easy but dan i'll let you talk to it yeah i think um you know in the first maybe half dozen episodes each each time we went to record Paul and I'd be like what are we going to talk about what are we going to make the next episode about oh god should we do our favorite cartoons should we do blah 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 and it it kind of felt quite stressful in the sense that like oh my god are we going to run out of topics after five shows um and what do we actually have anything interesting to say and I think what's kind of just kind of happened naturally over time is obviously we've got a bit of a format now where we talk about what we've been watching. Um, often we try to get in sync on a show. We've got our movie of the week. We've got our peak performances. And I think, as Paul said, what's good about it is like you can largely just kind of turn up and talk about that like obviously a little bit of prep is helpful having a few tabs open with some um, actors names and details and whatever it is but at the end of the day we, we never wanted this to be you know like we both have full-time jobs which unfortunately our, our job isn't isn't half measures full-time um so it, it's always had to be something that we could just kind of get into um record you know go away and, and, and live our lives and I think the format that we've got the show into now kind of really nicely allows for that. I would say one thing that like I was always impressed listening to your stuff because like your show is an hour sometimes hour and a bit you know in around that, that 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 time frame and you get through so much and i'm there going you know me and patty have it easy do you know every episode of doctor who cool we know what every episode of doctor who is we know exactly what we're going to be talking about for one week to the next and sometimes i i'm there on like Paddy and I usually record on a Sunday. I'm there on a Saturday evening going, oh crap, I didn't finish my notes. <laughs> and I'm like, how do you guys do it every week? You're talking about so many different things. And I'm like, seriously, I'm so impressed by the way you pull it off because I know you say it's, you know, it's half measures. You don't have a script. You don't have a, you don't have a plethora of notes. You have like a couple of tabs up and over. You'd never know that listening to it though. Do you know? That's, that's good to hear. That's good to hear because the only prep I do because I, I work in the office in Wellington City maybe you know, a couple of times a week and I typically will come back on the train. The train's about 45 minutes and so I'll put the notes together for, for the mailbag on the train on the way home and then I'll have dinner with my family <laughs> very quickly and then come in and Dan's always waiting for me because you know, he's just more organised and we hit record and we go. I'll, I'll tell you the one thing that it does, um, I think, make make me do is it makes me every week think oh god what am I going to watch I need to watch something new and always kind of be 
kind of pushing myself into I better watch something new on Netflix I better like and it like at the moment I'm watching The Shield um and I've just found out that it's, it's coming off Amazon Prime um in 10 days so I'm trying to like really like power my way through it but in the back of my mind I'm like but I need to try and fit in a couple of other TV shows got something new to talk about so it really does um push you into I guess not just sort of spending all your time searching through what to watch and actually just getting into some stuff and uh giving it a go mm. Yeah, it was like on my forty fifth watching of this particular thing, I've discovered this new small aspect of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but uh, cool. So, Trish, what's the next question on the list? Yeah, so one of the things I was wondering about. So, obviously, we're recording this remotely. Me and Patty did not fly to New Zealand because a, we love you, but no, um, and b, <laughs> that's way more money than either of us have, um, and b, COVID. Has COVID impacted you guys at all or were you always going to be doing it remotely? So I think, you know, so initially when we first started um, and COVID wasn't quite a thing, um, we were trying to kind of always trying to sync up schedules, like when can we record together? And it was it was a real nightmare. And I think the actual good thing that COVID did is it actually pushed us to recording on online and not worrying about being in the same room um, at the same time. So... And in a kind of a weird way, I think COVID has actually brought about the it brought about the weekly format, and it kind of got us used to um, doing this online. And it was sort of um, weird at first, I think, because I'm sure you guys have experienced this as well. Where when you're not in the room with someone, it's a little bit harder to pick up on their their cues for who's going to talk next or um, what's going to happen, or you know, if someone starts laughing or singing or whatever they're doing, um, it's it's quite a different experience but I think we're so used to recording this way that I don't think we'd change it for anything like this this is the way that we'll record half measures um and until until the end this is the way I don't want to go (laughs) (laughs) there is one thing with this format so me and Patty have been doing ours remotely from the off because obviously we started ours mid COVID um and I, I completely agree with you in that sense that it does allow you to have a format, you know, in terms of we have it on the calendar. For me and Paddy, it's every second Sunday, blah, blah, blah. Um, but there are things that do come up remotely that, you know, maybe don't come up in person. You know, one of the things that get edited out, and it happens at least once a week, I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet today, is we occasionally have to pause because Paddy has a small child <laughs> who sometimes likes to have her voice heard. So we just have to pause while she's settled and then we pick back up again. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think once she managed to sneak her way onto an episode and then <laughs> But um yeah, like that's I I, I love like your know, the um the it's you could always say it's like the thrill of the environmental factors, you know, how much are they gonna play into do I have to have like a broomstick beside me so I can like bang on the wall to get my neighbours to shut up. I'm working here. I find I, oh, yeah. I find it really satisfying that professional podcasts and i listen to a few of those because of covid are all recording from home as well and even they are suffering from the realities of life and it it, it yeah. brings a humanity to it doesn't it it makes it quite oh, good. Yeah. i'm not i'm not going to say that i enjoy hearing my you know my kids playing football downstairs or singing or whatever they're doing outside the room you know but uh yeah it's it's just what it is right yeah. Yeah. Look, sometimes definitely. I'll have a. I've got two small pugs, and sometimes they'll they'll walk in the room, and you can hear them like, you know, snorting and coughing and scratching at their toys and stuff. And then equally, uh, when we're recording a podcast, sometimes I'll hear or I'll see Paul lift up one one headphone, and he'll look at look at his door like like if his kids could see his look through that door, <laughs> they they would instantly go silent. But um, no, it's it's. It, I think it's just the the joys of recording from home. Um, so now that you've been doing it for over a year, what would you say is your greatest moment on the show? I, the, the, the kid in me will, will never get past having Starscream introduce, uh, something that I am a part of. That's insane. So that was pretty crazy moment. But in truth, the, I think it was that moment that based on the numbers we knew we had established a listener base and it kind of goes straight to that whole who the hell would want to listen to what I have to say type thing that I was talking about before and and so having regular listeners and being able to see 
them on, on our platform stats was, was really cool. And so when you can see pockets of listeners in different towns and cities in different countries and, and you can see that those listens continue. So we can see you guys in there in Ireland. We, we're presuming it's you listening. It's it's kind of it's kind of cool to think, you know, that they're not just a one listen wonder and that they're 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 choosing to turn in. So it was that moment where someone has chosen to listen and continue to listen that's that's amazing because i'm very picky about what podcasts i listen to so for half measures to make someone else's list is a bit mental for me and that was the moment that it was probably i would say is my greatest moment what about you dan yeah look i think i had that written down as, as my favorite as well i think uh, i i still remember the day that you sent me the uh voice recording of frank dodoro's star scream and it was just so amazing that we were getting engagement from somebody who voices Starscream on Transformers. It was just so epic. Um, I think another top moment for me would be, you know, when you sang Burning Ring of Fire oh, on the podcast, so just without, um, <laughs> you know, just like respect to you all for, for doing that. But I think any time that we get uh, engagement with, um, I guess, I like to think of them as the blue tick celebrities of the world on social media. It's always pretty exciting, and it's exciting when they start referencing what you have said in the in the episode, which is both terrifying and awesome because it sort of makes you think, like, oh god, like you you want to be honest and sort of give your your true reflection of something, but at the same time, you know, who, who are we really to give an opinion on some of this stuff? So. I think the one that the one that springs to mind down on what you said there was when we had the the writer of the zookeeper the zookeeper's wife um write into us and she responded to what you had said and obviously that the subject matter of that movie was was quite you know uh you know it was about the war and um having them come back and explain oh you know that this was the original script but things were left on the cutting room floor it's like <laughs> we never expected a writer to explain what happened to us and it, I I love that I love it yeah, because like that was one thing that I thought was kind of cool was like the when you actually I because I listened to that episode as well and like the the fact that she came back with such a detailed like summary of what went on just showed exactly like you know that your podcast was kind of getting her work out there as, as such you know. Mm-hmm. Um, would that be your because you get and I think you get a nice number of shout outs, likes, and retweets and stuff from actors writers directors who work on some of the shows and movies that you guys review and it's always nice to hear those in the mailbag every week mm. you know i can Im- only imagine what it's like for you when you see that popping up on twitter or instagram or whatever like oh my god they actually liked it would that be your favorite one or is there another one that for you was like oh my god we've re- we've now reached a new level in terms of social engagement dan i'll let you go first because i copied patty's style and got a three two one for this <laughs> um, I think one of my favourites is actually um, when we had that engagement from uh, Criminal UK on Netflix where we had the writers, so we had directors, we had the, the actresses, actors and actresses and you, you know we saw such a huge spike in our listens and, and again it was another example of them actually sort of referencing some of the things that, w- that we were saying you know they were telling us that we were well considered and again I just sort of laughed to myself like we're just two punks from New Zealand <laughs> just like you know re- recording a podcast really taking a half measure and and you and, and you're actually taking the time out of your day to, to listen to what we have to say it's it's pretty mind-blowing but that's that's probably one of the the top ones up there for me. Yeah, I think um, to your point, Tricia, around sort of seeing it come through live, it can be quite quite fun sometimes, particularly well when we had Ricky Gervais retweet us, because then you have to turn your phone on silent or at least your notifications because he's got like, like 14 million followers or something. And so you just get just people casually liking or retweeting. It just goes off the scale. But my um, in terms of you know, favorite shout out that we've received, my three, two, one. So my third place, I've put uh, Jason Manoka, who plays Megatron. Uh, in Transformers uh, War for Cybertron on Netflix he's written to us a few times and he's listened to both of our podcast reviews for the two Transformers seasons we've done and so that's like I guess we've done about 20 minutes that's like 40 minutes of his time that Megatron sorry Jason has listened to our, our podcast which is which is pretty crazy crazy I think um uh who did I oh yes yeah, so second I had Kerry Payton who most people will know as the king, King Ezekiel in The Walking Dead, or Cyborg uh, in the in the DC Titan series, and he he quote retweeted us, which is always my favourite uh, for the review we did of his movie Astronaut: The Last Push, and you know he said in that he was so proud of the movie and he thanked us for watching it. Um, 
and and then my number one would be the same as you dan and that was the reactions we got on twitter for the criminal uk review and so Catherine kelly who's the who plays dci hobbs you know she said it was what did i i took a screenshot of it here. it's great great to hear a thorough discussion and such enthusiasm for our show and then we had you know jim field smith who's the director and the creator and the writer of all the episodes and he he said he described us as a thoughtful discussion and he even gave us a moldy greeting as well i mean it's 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 too much it's great i i'd, I'd have to say um because I'm, I'm caught up on the war for cybertron now as well jason is fantastic as megatron yeah he's so good That's yeah right. he's so good in it and i actually remember um because I really enjoyed Criminal as well. I actually I binge watched uh, the second season just to be kind of I I know the guys are going to talk about this, so I'm going to prepare myself <laughs> and just see if I agree with them or disagree with them. And I always wonder, you know, these are the actors and directors who have listened to us and taken the time to get in touch. And I always wonder, you know, who else might have listened and not actually let us know. So in my mind, Dan, I'm thinking Bob Odenkirk. Rosario Dawson, Jason Alexander, Jeffrey Dean Morgan. You know, I'm like 90% sure that one of them at least has, li- has, has listened to the show, right? We can only hope. Yeah. <laughs> um, so actually just on that kind of subject, um, you interviewed us on your uh, podcast uh, a couple of months ago, which was great crack. Um, who would be your dream interview on an episode of your podcast? I, I think for us, one of the one of the the number one would surely have to be Jonathan Banks. Um, just the, the namesake of our um, of our podcast. Uh, but I think anyone in that, uh, I think Breaking Bad, uh, Better Call Soul Universe, Bob Odenkirk, Brian Cranston, um, God, you know, Mark Hamill. Like I, I don't know. I, you know, go big, I guess, but. I, I couldn't even narrow it down. I think my number one when um, when I saw that question was definitely Jonathan Banks, though. Yeah, I, I think realistically, as who we might one day manage to get on, if we pulled out all the stops and got lucky, then yeah, Jonathan Banks as as Mike Gurman track. He's you know he's played that character across both Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, and he's he's probably my favorite character for that whole universe and um, just a great voice. And so that that would be pretty awesome. And and like you, Dan, like in a total dream world, never going to happen. But it's not. I would probably go with Mark Hamill because you know, as a kid, I felt that Luke Skywalker's journey and his values and and all those things were something that inspired me. You know, and and I think he's a real like enthusiastic person who would embrace fans as well. So I think that would be quite satisfying. Otherwise, like you, I would you know go big or go home. So you know, Jerry Seinfeld, Paul McCartney, Taylor Swift, Ricky Gervais. I don't you know any of those. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we you mentioned that like you know every week you guys go through you know what tv shows what movies you watch sometimes you talk about you know podcasts they listen to or whatever so we're going to go with our standard alone on an island right so you're stranded on an island you can pick one tv show you can't do all of star trek because technically they're different tv shows Thanks. paul <laughs> right so you can't pick one of them so one tv show one film franchise we will let you have multiple films in a film franchise because you can't just have one Star Wars film. That would be sad. One book and one podcast back catalogue. So, TV show, film, book, podcast back catalogue. What do you pick to take to your desert island? So, should we do TV first then? I, I, uh, I feel like I want to say something that I just love, like Next Generation or, or Better Call Saul. But if I'm going to be stranded on an island, I've done some thought here, I may as well go with something with a lot of episodes. And so actually, for the context of this scenario, believe it or not, I actually would go with Doctor Who simply because there is so much to watch and so much that I haven't seen. And I got real angry at Netflix when they, they took it off um, and when I was sort of mid-watch of the... Of the um, of, of you know of new who not not the reboot as you incorrectly called it the other day Paddy just saying um the, yeah. the new oh, who yeah. <laughs> I'd have the whole lot the classic who and the new who um that would be my uh I would go with that for my tv what about you Dan yeah I was a bit like you I, I started off thinking oh would I go for like a breaking bad or a vertical soul or and then I thought to myself oh, I probably wouldn't want to be stuck with that show but what's a tv show that I've already watched a hundred times and I could watch a hundred times more the office I knew it I uh, the the US office I 
I can't even talk about it without thinking about wanting to watch it again. So I'll, I'll just leave it there. But it's it would be a great Desert Island watch. Yeah, that that's recently come to Netflix over here. So I think I'll... like Because I've seen bits and pieces of it. So I think I'll finally just sit down and make my way through it. it it's like, you know, it's obviously... Um, if you've if you've really uh, lived and breathed the the UK one, it's a bit of a a hard first season to swallow. But once you get past that, it's got some really lovable characters, and they, you know, and a I I don't always say this about American TV shows, but I think they actually they really took this and made it something special. Mm. Yeah, definitely good good call. Um, so film franchise, uh, I wouldn't. I'm not going to lie. It just simply would have to be Star Wars for me. I've watched these things more times than I can ever count, and they never disappoint me. So I would take with me the, the 12 Star Wars films. So we've got the nine Skywalker saga. You know, we've got Rogue One, we've got Solo, we've got the Clone Wars movie. Plus I'm going to insist that any new movies also get delivered to me on this island. So that's Rogue Squadron, <laughs> there's the Kevin Feige movie, there's the Taika Waititi movie, and the Ryan Johnson trilogy. So, yeah. That that would be my film franchise. Yeah, we'll just make sure to airdrop those for you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. We you won't rescue you. We'll just airdrop <laughs> them fine. to you. That's fine. That's fine. As we're playing on Paul, Paul, I just, This is his dream. He would love that to be on an island with no no interaction with anyone. No neighbours. Paul would be like that crusty the clown thing. It's like, we can save you. You just keep on driving. Yeah, you right. just keep on moving. <laughs> uh, uh, I think it would be the same for me. I, I had Star Wars as well. I, I think it's another um, franchise I've just watched so much of, um, and I'm, I'm always up for a Star Wars watch. So same for me. Awesome. Uh, book is the next one. Book. Ah, oh, see. Dan, <laughs> you go first. Okay. Um, I, this is going to be a little bit painful because I'm going to have to split the trilogy and you never want to split the trilogy but I think I'm, I might go with the Lord of the Rings um, I, I always enjoy uh, you could you could buy like an, you could have like your, an oh, omnibus, oh, the omnibus that has okay, all three okay. of them okay. on one backing <laughs> oh, I will allow that oh, thank, thanks Trisha I appreciate that I'll go with the omnibus of the Lord of the Rings so that I get uh, all, all three in there um, I it's a it's a good hearty read. Lots of great characters. Um, I did consider having the Lord of the Rings as my uh, my film franchise, but I thought you know what, I'll keep Star Wars and I'll go with the go with the books for Lord of the Rings. This is unbelievable because this is my answer as well, but for different reasons. So my wife has the books and sh- and she she loves the books just like so many other people do. And I'm probably gonna have a few people start swearing at the you know listening to this, but I started to read the first book and i could not handle the writing style the very short sentences no commas it was everything was a full stop i couldn't handle it but again if i'm going to be on a desert island i figure if you've only got one book you're going to make an effort to read it so that was my rationale there as well because um yeah it's it's a movie franchise that i love and it annoys me i feel ashamed of myself that i can't get into the books i keep waiting for my kids to want to read it because that'll force me to do it as well but um yeah, unbelievably, the same choice for me. Savage. Cool. And lastly, you've got one podcast back catalogue. Oh, this, this is tough. Mm. Um, you know, practically, I probably should be trying to find some pod- podcast that's about surviving um, or, you know, how to make a shelter or how to make a knife out of a coconut or something. But I... I, I I, I couldn't do it to myself. So um, I'm actually going to go with a podcast called uh, Sacred Symbols. And it's a, it's a podcast basically about, um, it's mostly about PlayStation and gaming. And I'm not going to have any access to PlayStation or gaming or anything, but I really enjoy the, the banter and the conversation on that podcast. So that's probably the one I'd go with. Um, it's definitely not going to serve me any value apart from filling in time. I love I love the uh, the idea of actually getting a survival podcast down because let's be honest, if there were ever someone who were going to be stranded on a desert island, we would be the worst. You know, we would have, we would have no chance. You know, Tom Hanks in Castaway is a million years ahead of us, right? I think we would be finding sticks to turn them into lightsabers, not turning them into <laughs> like shelters. So. <laughs> By the end of the evening, we'd be like, oh, we should probably go looking for some food. KFC's probably shut this time of night. Um, 
So this was a tough one as well. And um, a, a podcast that I absolutely love is uh, is Retrogram, which revisits TV futures from the past by examining yesteryear's television, science fiction and superhero shows. Um, I may have just read that from a note I made. Um, but it's a real great pod, but it's only been going for less than two years. So the back catalogue wouldn't last me as long. So in the end, I am going to go, <laughs> you're really showing my class here, uh, a podcast called Quickly Kevin Will He Score, which is a British podcast hosted by Josh Widdicombe. Um And Quickly Kevin is a podcast that talks about 90s uh, football with some great interviews from players back in the day. And so I get to reminisce about, you know, the 90s, which appeals to me as a 90s teenager. It's comedy because Josh Widdicombe is, is, is hilarious. And uh, and it's football as well. And so um, and there's well over 100 episodes over an hour long. So there's plenty uh, for me to listen to on this island whilst I go looking for, for for food and work on my my amazing tan uh, josh would come he is really funny i like watching clips of him on the last leg with uh, adam hills and the other fellow whose name i can't think of now at the moment i feel so bad but uh you know he is really funny yeah i love when we're talking about like, you know, you're stranded on this desert island you're like oh i really should listen to like a podcast about survival it's like yeah we're also partly giving you like a tv and a dvd player <laughs> and, <laughs> and, 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 and enough power to keep them going perpetually yeah <laughs> Yet, yet we wouldn't spring for a console for Dan. No, just that's way too fucking much. <laughs> Be realistic here. Um, cool. So I have one question. Uh, so the, I think we can wrap up the questions here. There's one there that I kind of half jokingly put down was that on the Half Measures podcast, Dan does these big elaborate introductions for Paul in the vein of Ric Flair, Superstar Billy Graham, Apollo Creed, whatever. So, question: Does Dan think that Paul could actually beat Ric Flair? <clears throat> now you see, Petty, um, Paul's normal course of action wouldn't be wouldn't be violence <laughs> or confrontation. Though, if the Nature Boy Ric Flair said something like, "You know, Michael Keaton is the worst Batman I've ever seen. The Last Jedi should be struck from the Jedi archives. Star Trek is sleepier <laughs> than." <laughs> Than TV at my grandma Canal's house. The Optimus Prime couldn't lead the Autobots to a truck stop convention, let alone defeat the Decepticons. He would, he would beast mode. He would rage out. He would be giving Ric Flair the biggest chest slaps that you've ever seen, yelling out "Woo!" as it, as he's doing it. So um, I think you'd have to really, you'd have to really fire him up. But I think once yeah. you got him there, I think he could do it. Nice. He's he's nice. pretty old now, Ric Flair, isn't he? Like he must be. Um, like, Rick Rick Flair is in that like Keith Richards category yeah. in the sense so, of like, he, he is just somehow he's being held together by just like sheer cosmic energy right. and possibly alcohol. <laughs> well, actually, no. In Rick's case, no actual alcohol. Yeah. So, it's just, yeah, but he's in his seventies now at this stage. Yeah, I've uh, and I, I've never really watched WWF right, but I, uh, I I do find it makes some really satisfying gifts. So when someone says something to someone that absolutely wrecks them, I, I really love to reply <laughs> yeah. with a with a Hulk Hogan or a Rock or a Ric Flair gif wiping someone out. So I, I find that really yeah. satisfying. Oh, they're so good. I'm just going to show my ignorance here. When Paddy sent me on this question, I was really going, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> 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 Who or what is a Ric Flair? <laughs> uh so one thing as well like that myself and Trish have been constantly kind of giggling at um, over the last number of months is the creation of the time travelling team drinking game so what are the full list of rules for the drinking game so I um, I, I was listening to an episode of uh, time travelling team on my way back from Wellington uh, one day and in Paddy's recap Trisha I feel like he said the doctor. Sorry, that's my, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> Sorry, that was the doctor. If we're going to pronounce it correctly. Yeah. Also, by the way, I love the way you both the, both you the way you pronounce Dalek, but that's a different subject. Um, uh, I felt like he said the doctor like a hundred times, and and then in the character discussion as well, we, you know, um, I felt like if if there was a, a drinking game where every time Paddy says the doctor that would that would you know that would really get the party going and then i sort of thought how else can i you know what else what other rules can we get and i'm i felt like in the in the in the character discussion trisha you really you really went full samuel jackson 
and every other word was a so, <laughs> was a swear word. And I think you would, I think we because we were talking about the the greatest companion of all time, i.e., you know, Stephen Taylor. And I think oh. every time you swore, I thought again, if, if people had to take a drink, uh, it, w- it would be really good. The, the funny thing is, is to be fair. You pro- people would never get to, to Trisha swearing because everyone would have passed out during Paddy's recap. So, those are the those are the rules <laughs> of, of the of the time traveling uh, drinking game, which um, has sort of taken a life of its own on Twitter. I think. Yes, I took it slightly differently in the in the sense that you'd be watching uh, episodes of Doctor Who, and so um, I thought of four rules that you could consider um, if you want to roll them out as your own game. So one, every time you hear the whirly machine of the TARDIS, um, you have to take a drink and you have to text the last person that you text to say we're going on an adventure. <laughs> I think um, if a Dalek says exterminate, you have to run around the room in a circle impersonating a Dalek and then sit down and have a drink. <laughs> now, I know that um, the, the sonic screwdriver is in sort of a, a bit more of the later episodes, but um, every time the Doctor uses the sonic screwdriver, you need to finish your drink. And then my, my final rule is... If a random member of the public looks puzzled at the TARDIS, you have to swap drinks with the person opposite you. <laughs> nice. I'm glad I don't drink. <laughs> 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 because I think we would be absolutely hammered. Smashed to mm. fuck. <laughs> um I like I stopped drinking a number of years ago. Uh but I used to play one drink game which was the Cowboy Bebop drinking game. Uh Cowboy Bebop is a fantastic anime series. And there was one of the rules was like, you know, like or some of the rules were uh drink every time someone, you know, lights a cigarette, drink twice when that cigarette becomes unsmokable, and drink uh, every time the dog Ein barks. <laughs> and there's one episode which is essentially their version of Alien. Ein does not shut the fuck up <laughs> and like Spike can never finish a cigarette because it keeps getting destroyed or burnt and it's like it's like the Roxanne drinking game by the police you know it's just drink every time he says Roxanne drink every time he says red light and it's like I'm stop please no more brilliant so uh, to wrap up as a bit of payback <laughs> uh, when we appeared on the guys podcast they gave us a Doctor Who quiz so now I'm going to give uh, Dan and Paul a series of questions based on the TV shows and the movies that they frequently discuss on their podcast. So, um, shall we begin, lads? Mm. Okay, cool. Now, question one. In Seinfeld, why do Newman and Kramer hate Major League Baseball star Keith Hernandez? Dan, this is you. <laughs> is it? I know I've watched it recently, but you've watched it more times than me. You've got your profile picture as a picture of Drawker Sander. This is definitely you. I honestly, I I can't remember. I feel like this is off to a really bad start. This is this is not making great um, podcasting quiz material. We, we've really failed. Paul, I I just I I remember the but uh, yeah oh, he did he slight someone or did he? I just can't I just can't recall it, Paddy. So it's kind of in reference to your uh, one of your peak performance picks for Kevin Costner this week. He, they think he spit on them. Yes, it's the the magic the magic loogie theory. That's right. That's right. And <laughs> there's right. the slow motion scenes of him doing it and the memory yeah. and the flashbacks. Yes, yeah. there you go. Ba- back and back into the left, and you know. <laughs> uh, cool. So question two: In Breaking Bad, which poet's book of poems lead Hank to the identity of Heisenberg? We're in a lot of trouble, Dan, let's be honest. This is a bit like the Seinfeld one where I can picture it and I just can't but I, I can see I can see the book. I can't see the words. <laughs> what an embarrassment, Paul. I think we need to it's, end the podcast. It's, yeah, it's, this is all over. I can see for, for my for my WW and you know and I can hear him singing the song with all the elements, but the poet Paddy, no. this level of question is... You've got trouble. us, Paddy. You've got us. <laughs> it is Walt Whitman. Oh, WW, I knew that much, but I couldn't... Think yeah. Of it. yeah. We'll, give you, we'll give you half marks, half measure marks for that one. <laughs> uh, cool. Question three. You're gonna, like, I think you're going to hate us by the end of this. <laughs> we'll hear no more shout-outs. I, I, I had the third question is what colour is a fire engine because that's, 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 <laughs> yeah. that's the level we're looking for. Okay. Question three. In The Mandalorian... 
what creature does Mando kill that he will receive his first sigil for? What is it called? Yeah, I can see it. Again, we'll give you half marks if you can describe the actual creature to well, it's, us. It's, it's, like that, it's like that big uh, rhino type thing, isn't it? Um, and it's kind of, it's a big shaky thing. God. Mm. Yeah. It's like the one that they have in the Attack of the Clones almost. Um, the name of it. There's a reason our podcast is half measures. <laughs> <laughs> so it is called a mud horn. Ah. Ah. But again, half marks for the rhino Son reference because it looks like a bit, it's like a cross between a woolly mammoth and a, a, a rhino. Okay. Um, question four. In The Walking Dead, what does Negan say as he beats Glenn to death? I, I remember him coming out and I remember him, him, him sort of making a, a reference to it's crapping your pants time and... Then he does eeny, meeny, miny, mo. What does he say specifically to Glenn? He doesn't say it's pee pee pants time, does he? Or is that it's, it's a different point? Uh, no, he says he's taking it like a champ. Oh, uh, God. Oh, Dan, you should have known that. <laughs> <laughs> champ is like your favourite word. Uh, as a former champ, you should definitely know it. <laughs> okay. Uh, question five True or false? Criminal UK Season 2 reunites Mark Stanley, who played Gren in Game of Thrones, and Kit Harrington, who played Jon Snow in Game of Thrones, for an interrogation scene. I don't know Kit Harrington, so I'm guessing True. that there could be a trick question here. Maybe they were in two different episodes. Or was it just... You're, a- you're, you're correct. Mark Stanley does appear in the show, but not in the same scene as Kit Harrington. <laughs> Yeah, like, I, I think they hate me now, Trish. <laughs> <laughs> These are really good questions. Yeah. I, rem- I remember when we did the Doctor Who quiz for you, I remember after the first couple of just thinking, have we pitched it at the right level? Is it way too easy? Is it way too hard? It's so hard to know, right? <laughs> um, question six. On what planet is our... Sorry, on what planet was Khan and his crew stranded on in Ra- Star Trek II Rattle Khan? SETI Alpha 5. Yay! I was like, oh, thank God. I was yeah. like, thank God. Like, when I heard Seti, I was like, woo! <laughs> I'm not an evil, vindictive bo- bollocks. <laughs> uh, question seven. What alias does Brian O'Connor use when he first meets Dom in The Fast and the Furious? Well, this is definitely my wheelhouse, so I'll handle this one, yeah. Dan. Um, it's Brian Spooner. Yes, it is. Exactly. Good stuff. Because um, I was trying to go like, okay, how much of the Fast and Furious franchise have I seen? And what's a good question that could potentially <laughs> throw them off? Question eight. According to legend, which singer passed out in the boot when they recorded their Bond team song? Now, bonus points for the correct song and extra bonus points if Paul sings a bit of it. There'll be no singing from me, so <laughs> don't don't worry about that. There'll be no extra bonus points. So they passed out in the booth. I, I, do we make an intelligent guess? Not intelligent, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, playing the numbers guess in terms of someone who sang more than one Bond theme. You know, that gives us a bit more of a, a chance. But uh, I don't know. Shirley Bassey's not unlikely to pass out, is she? Paul McCartney wouldn't. He's too healthy. I... Louis Armstrong. No. It is Tom Jones for Thunderball. When he hits the final Thunderball note, uh, he says himself that he felt dizzy and blacked out a bit. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. That's dedication. He's, he's human after all. Hmm. Uh, question nine. In the Lord of the Rings trilogy, how many cameos does director Peter Jackson have? So he's definitely got one in the last... Uh, I think he's... So he's got definitely one in the last one. He's, this. I can see him in a bar scene. He's like at a bar or mm. at the inn or something. Uh, he probably did one each movie. I, I'd say three. Yeah. yeah, it's three. He is the carrot-eating man in The Village of Bree in the first one, which he reprised for The Hobbit. Uh, he's one of the soldiers at Helm's Deep. You see him chuck a spear at an uruk And he's also in the extended version of Return to King. He plays one of the pirates that is mm-hmm. making its way down the river to Minas Tirith. Nice. 
And final question, question 10. In the G1 Transformer series, name any three of Soundwave's mini cassettes. Laserbeat, Ravage, Frenzy, Rumble, Buzzsaw. <laughs> yes, cool. I, I needed need to, <laughs> need to get something in there, Dan. I needed to get something in there. There's one more if you uh, that I think only came out in the in the movie. Um, it was first introduced in the movie. If you can think of it, I said frenzy. Eh? Uh, yeah, you went frenzy rumble, who are essentially pallet swaps of each other. There's laser beacon buzzsaw, same thing. Ravage, obviously everyone's favorite. I can picture that as well. What's the first letter? Can I have that? R R R is the first letter. It's Ratbat. Oh. oh, of course, of course. Yeah. So yeah, like yeah, again, I I, yeah, I think he did a lot better, a lot better than you think he did, uh, and it just realised that up according to tradition, I think it's actually true. I am kind of the evil one when it comes to trivia. <laughs> yeah, I feel I feel a bit bad that I was like, oh, we should. They gave us a quiz. We'll give them a quiz. They watched a lot of things that I haven't watched. I will just roll out Paddy <laughs> to <laughs> Although you got roll six, him out like that for us. <laughs> yeah. You got six out of I, ten. Um, is your final score? I've never felt more like Goro from Mortal Kombat in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> just like the two lads are having fun, all of a sudden bring out the beast. It, it does remind me though. Like I don't know if we mentioned this on your podcast. I'm trying to remember uh, when we were in college. Paddy and I did a Doctor Who quiz, and it was ten rounds. 10 questions per round and I don't think we actually looked up a single question we literally sat on your couch and just were just throwing out questions and Paddy still has the sheets of paper where we were like oh this is a good question this is a good question and we thought like we didn't have to google any of it it was all like to us like high level it was fine and then we did the quiz and like there wasn't that many people were there um, but like one team left <laughs> because they <laughs> thought it was too hard and people were literally like what the hell are these questions and we were like but they're just like nerdy Doctor Who questions because this is a Doctor Who quiz <laughs> there's nerds oh. and then there's nerds Oh, I think one of the nerdiest things I ever did was uh, or we were at um, every year in our college uh, University College Cork there's a gaming convention called WarpCon uh, unfortunately it didn't happen this year because of covid and it's very sad times but they have a table quiz on their friday nights and there's uh the last couple of years they did an eight bit music round which was they took famous team tunes and they re-recorded them as eight bit tracks i have never seen more nerd frustration in my life <laughs> <laughs> especially when the robocop one was done it was like everyone was like oh god what the hell is that no i think six out of ten on a paddy written quiz very good form particularly because i mean you were asking us questions about one show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you had 10 different ones to answer for. So that was really good. And do you know what? that's bringing us round to the end. So Dan Paul, if people want to find you guys online, where can they look for you? You can find us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram at Half Measures Pod or Half Measures Podcast uh, on Instagram and also halfmeasurespodcast.com. Awesome. And your episodes drop on Fridays, isn't that right? Yeah, Fridays uh, New Zealand time at uh, four PM. I'm not sure what time that is in in Ireland. That's when Trish it's, wakes up. I think, <laughs> uh, at at the moment, I think it's like because you're 13 hours ahead. It's like three AM in the morning. So I think. Well, no, before Trish goes so, to bed. Yeah. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so sometimes, like, just as I'm going to go to bed, I get, like, a little notification saying, new half measures, and I'm like, woohoo, that's my morning sorted. (laughs) (laughs) Guys, thank you very much for being on. We really appreciate it. Um, It's lovely to get to reciprocate, although you obviously interviewed us many, many moons ago. Um, It's just taken a little bit while (laughs) for us to get to a natural point. But thank you very much, and we'll obviously include your socials and stuff in the episode description, and highly recommend if you have any interest in any sort of film or tv check out the guys because they're absolutely awesome yes uh always a pleasure guys and hopefully down again we'll be able to hang out again down the road in the future awesome thank you for having us it's been it's been really fun yeah it's been a, a lot of fun thank you so much and uh yeah i really look forward to your episode next week when you dive into patrick Troughton, uh one of my favorite doctors so i'm really looking forward to hearing 
how we go with the uh, the second Doctor. So thanks, guys. No problem, guys. Adios. And that brings us to the end of this rambling in the TARDIS. We would like to, once again to thank Paul and Dan for joining us. Each week, Paul and Dan discuss a wide range of movies and TV shows on their podcast, Half Measures, and we will include their details in the episode description, and we highly recommend that you check them out. And as always, we would love to hear what you thought about an adventure in space and time. So to share your thoughts, you can find us at Time Teamp, that's T-I-M-E-T-E-A-M-P, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or you can email us at timetravellingteamp at teampproductions.com. Join us next week when we'll be back to our normal format with the first story of the Patrick Trenton era, The Power of the Daleks. Bye. Bye.